In a haunted house, a family lived until the mom got possessed and attacked the kids. Everybody and welcome to episode number 11 of Talking Pictures Alliance. How are you today, Jeff? Welcome. Welcome. I'm scared crapless. Crapless. <laughs> so so what's your level of scareometer here? Cuz we are officially in October, the one month where I think horror aficionados truly get to enjoy things. Absolutely. I think I like being scared. A lot of people don't don't like being scared. I like going to haunted houses. I like being scared. I think it's fun. Um, did you know that there, because I was talking about this with some people at work, there are haunted houses that you can go to where you go in alone. Uh, I did not know that, but I do know there are haunted houses where you can sign waivers so that the people can touch you. Yeah, no, thank you. I don't want to go alone. I mean, I I preface this by saying I like being scared, but let's be real. It's fun when you go with other people and other people are scared too. And it's like a fun thing. And maybe you have some drinks and you're out there and you're, you know, you're, you're doing fun stuff. But when, if you were to go like in a room alone and it was dark and there were people and then signing a waiver where people can touch you and stuff like that while you're inside. No, no, that's taking it to the next level. And I don't need that. Yeah, exactly. Right. There's there's imaginary horror, what your mind can do to you. And then there's physical stuff. And that's that's the line, I think, for most people. Give me as scared as you can psychologically. But when that physical stuff comes in, I'm done. I'm out. No waivers. Yeah, no. Or like and I mean, I think exactly what we're going to talk about a whole lot today. So I'll, I'll wait to talk about it. But it, there are things that can just be too real. And that's what makes it even scarier. Yes. And that's the beauty as we segue into The Conjuring, today's movie, released in 2013, directed by James Wan, who also directed Saw and Dead Silence and The Conjuring 2. And he's doing Aquaman, actually. He's the director of Aquaman. So I'm super excited for Aquaman because I love this director. But it's a story that follows a family who moves into a haunted farmhouse. They hire a couple, Ed and Lorraine Warren, to come in and figure out what's going on. They have to exercise the ghost. Exercise or excise? <laughs> I think it's exercise. Okay. I think you said it right. I feel like by saying exercise the ghost, you know, they give it a good <laughs> uh, good routine. You know, they feed it healthy food. It feels better about itself and it moves on. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty much a ghost story, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think... It, yeah, a ghost story is a good way of putting it, but I really like what you what you're writing here at the top. Mixing of genres, you know, the the haunting story with the ghost, but then also it's got the exorcism piece to it and the the whole unknown section when it comes to like the religion aspects of this horror film. And I think it's it does it really well, and that's what makes this film really good. Yeah, it's kind of unexpected, right? Because usually so I, I mean, if we go back to the the OG exorcist movie, the exorcist, there aren't really ghosts there. There's a single demonic entity that's causing havoc in a house and that has to be dealt with. But if, and then we go into ghost movies and it's a lot, lots of ghosts, right? And maybe there's possession, but not really exorcism stuff. So to see these two mesh together in such a way that feels fresh i guess it, f it felt fresh when i saw it but also it, it really worked together it was exciting to see yeah it's it's very well done and i know let, let's let's get this done with at the top of the at the top of the show here i think that horror movies get a bad rap right because i mean logistically they are some of the cheapest films to make for uh these production companies and and all of these types of things to make a horror film and then uh they can fall into a lot of tropes right i mean these horror movies that we see that we make fun of all the time fall into the tropes that we've seen before and i think part of that is because people are just expecting jump scares and you know this this crazy story that they've seen before what i think the conjuring does really well is it 
like you said, it mixes these genres together and uh, it makes it a, a film that's a hybrid of these other horror films that we've seen before. So you don't get tired of one specific type of horror film in this movie because it's giving you multiple types yeah right and i think something too going even further to that it kind of challenges the horror trope and, and keeps it exciting is that it doesn't fall into the ruts of here's a family who's moved into a haunted house there's we don't spend an hour of them trying to convince people that this is actually happening they they go to demonologists and they're believed 100% from the beginning. You have the wife that can see ghosts. She sees the evil presence. You have the demonologist who, who I guess, just wants to fight demons. <laughs> Patrick Wilson, I feel like he's walking. He's the jock, and he just wants to punch demons with crosses. <laughs> Absolutely. And this goes on another note that you wrote here that there's no scene where they're not believed, right? And I do think that that is rare. If you go to a lot of uh, horror films, there's always that, well, there's no way there's a demon inside of my daughter and there's no way that there's a ghost haunting my house or that there's a killer on the loose. And, you know, people are kind of living in this world of... uh they're, they're putting it all aside and then it comes out at the end. And you're like, oh, it is real. Oh, crap. Like, we're all going to die kind of thing. And in this film, like you said, from the start, I mean, it starts with them being in a classroom talking to people about what's happening. And even everyone in the classroom that they're talking to people about is down. They're down for this story. They're like, oh, yeah, hell yeah. Nobody raises their hand and says, uh, don't you think that this would probably not be real kind of thing? And they, they don't talk about that at all. And the, the ending quote of the film is interesting that they chose to end it with that because it is Patrick Wilson's character who is quoted at the end of the film. And again, this is based on a true story, which is even creepier, right? But he says that these things are real and these things happen. So hold on to your butts. Dude, you're absolutely right. And the few times we see it, they're they're kind of throwaway, right? There's no one in the audience. Like, I expected a reporter to be there, you know, asking yeah. those stupid questions and just dragging the scene on. But no, it's the wife, Lorraine, who makes the joke that sometimes they're called fakes. And, uh, and when they're showing the guy around their house of haunted collectibles, the guy legit believes it. And it's the wife who makes the comment, thank goodness it wasn't someone who didn't believe again. And I think the only other time after that is the police officer they hire in the haunted house when they're sitting up all night trying to catch evidence of this demon. And, you know, he said it was a draft. Or something. And then uh, Drew, I believe his name is, makes fun of him for the rest of the film for it. Yeah. And those are the minority of people in the movie, right? Uh, who don't believe that this could be a real thing. And so I think that that is also something that lends the film to feel faster. Like you said, like it feels like the film is moving faster because we don't have to convince all of these people that it's real first. Rather, what we have to do in this movie is convince the uh, the couple that's there to help that it's actually a serious situation that requires their help. Because apparently, and doing research of this couple in real life, they were super freaking busy because people thought that their houses were, you know, they were haunted, possessed, they needed exorcisms, and re in reality, it was the hot water heater and stuff like that, you know, so... I think that's a cool shift for most of this that that really pushes it along. Yeah, you're right. And there was even a scene in the movie where they they're checking out a couple's house and Patrick Wilson shows them it's simply water heater. It's the wind coming through an old window and then it's an echoing through the pipes. And that's it. That's it. But the best part too is that uh like we start the supernatural stuff from the get-go. So as the audience, we don't need to be convinced. We've seen a haunted doll. This freaky thing that these these poor teen girls... By the way, don't ever invite a spirit into your house. I don't know about you, Jeff, but if, if a strange thing was like, hey, can I possess this doll because I'm totally an eight-year-old girl who died here, would you say yes to that? No. And, you know, that happens in a lot of horror movies, right? That is one trope that The Conjuring does 
in the opening scene, it does it a lot. But then throughout the film, there are those little moments where why would you go in the basement? Like, what are you doing? Why Why would you ever go down there? You know what I would do? I would GTFO, get in a car, and drive away from that place so fast, right? That's a reality, but that falls into horror movies. Like, I got to go down in the basement to check on whatever, and then you, you go down there, right? So at the beginning of the film, when the nurses are like, we're nurses, we felt bad for this ghost, so we let her take over this doll. What? <laughs> Right. I mean, I guess they were empathetic. And, you know, if it is actually a child spirit. But I love that when they're they're talking to Ed and Lorraine, Ed and Lorraine are both like, you guys are idiots. What are you, <laughs> no. Did you even see the thing to verify that it was a child's ghost? <laughs> yeah, I am not going to let this go. If a ghost comes to you, if that asshole looks like a child or looks like a adult or looks like a freaking cotton candy machine, I am not letting that thing inhabit a doll in my house. No way. Jose, don't care if I'm a nurse. Don't care if I'm anybody. No, 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 no. You get out. You get out and you stay out. This is not welcome <laughs> in my place. We're done here. We're, we're done here. You're done. Probably not a child. Go. Be gone. Yeah. But that that opening scene, uh that that kind of shows uh horror movie budgets to me because those actresses and the actor uh in that scene are not uh the teenage kids or the you know the young the young kids in that scene are not super uh super well portrayed in the movie. I think that their, their lines kind of sound like line readings and things, and it's not the strongest opening for performances, but, but I think that the, when they put the doll outside in the trash can and then they go to bed at, uh, that night and there's those intense knocks at the door that sound like pounding, not a little kid's hand, like a full on adult, smashing the front door to, to like something is wrong. That is one of the scariest moments in the film to me. I actually think just because that could be real. You could be asleep in your bed at night and somebody pounds on your front door. And that would be terrifying. Whether it's, you know, just your neighbor looking for a glass of milk at three o'clock in the morning or a demonically possessed doll that you just happen to create yourself duh knocking on the front door and trying to get into your house that's scary crap and it doesn't take a lot of you know effects blood guts any of that kind of stuff to make that scary it, it's good yeah and that speaks to the whole film right because when we look at the spectacles that horror movies can be this is black box at its finest i mean there are some wire effects sure there are some 3d things thrown in to create a bit more horror but this is legit black black box theater in a house that they built with and the restraint this director shows throughout the film with his scares is amazing right like the scene where the girl wakes up because her put her foot's being pulled and she's looking at the corner and it's all dark, and she's talking about the dude that's standing there. And then the sister goes to check it out, and there's no one there. Nothing. No one shows up during this. There's no jump scare, no hands. It's just darkness. Yeah. And the only thing spooky is that the door slams. Oh, it's... I mean, there are a couple a couple of things. One of the things that gets me in horror movies, and this film does it a couple of times, is when you are looking at the person that's talking and there's something still in the background and it never, ever, like, they never address it sometimes. I think that's the creepiest thing when that happens. Like, there's a scene in the, the new um, production of It where uh, the kid is sitting in the library and he's reading a book and there's a librarian that's behind him and she's like demonically possessed. She's so far away from where he is. But if you pay really close attention, you can see her and she's just standing completely still in the corner looking at the kid. It cuts away and it cuts back and she's still standing in the same position. And then it never addresses it ever in the movie. And you're like, 
oh man, that is some scary crap. So in this movie, when she goes out on the uh, pier and she's out on the pier and she's talking to her husband and she turns around and behind him are just the hanging legs. Oh man, come on. That is some good stuff. And there's no jump scare there. There's no, you know, the, the soundtrack kind of alludes to what's happening, but it's not like a Hoo! kind of moment that scares the crap out of you. I mean, that stuff is good. Yeah. Yeah. And to to take the hanging further, when she falls into the basement, and you know she the mom finally tells her the big reveal has happened, and then she sees the hanging legs. Right, you hear the rope, and and I like that you hear the rope whenever something yeah. crazy happens, and then it slowly starts turning the feet. And you're just like, oh, get out of this freaking place! And and I like the music box for that reason. Because this music box, I think, is something that tests the audience courage throughout the film. Because the first time you look at it, nothing happens. Second time, you see the little boy. And it's kind of a jump scare, but not really. He's just standing there. And then the film ends. Are you brave enough to watch the mirror of the music box as it finishes by the end of this movie? And the first time, I was not. Well... No, I mean, it, it, watching it, you think something's going to happen and nothing happens. And OK, another thing, right? Why would you keep all that stuff in your house? Come on. <laughs> Dude, I have this question every time I watch this movie, right? And you got a little girl with you, too. But Kyle's like, well, it's because there are rules for it. And that's an interesting point because we we are in a movie where there are rules that help contain these things. Don't touch. And it's blessed every week by a priest. And I guess that's enough to contain it. Yeah, it's I, I think that is something that makes this film unique in the way. And I love this thought because usually when you think about it, you think that, uh, you know, the doll is possessed. Or if you're talking about, you know, the music box, that the music box is possessed, right? But they go into detail in this movie that the demons are not possessing these items, but they're possessing the minds of the people that are experiencing these supernatural things happening to these items. So the doll is not a, you know, a conduit for a demon. It's, it's those people that are allowing the demons to get inside of their mind to be, bring the illusion that the doll is possessed. I love that. I think it's cool. And they go into the whole, you know, three-step process of, you know, being possessed. And the first step is, you know, you start seeing things and then it starts attacking you physically. And then at the third step, you are completely taken over by the demon. I, I, I think that's a cool, unique way uh, of showing that. And, and of course, back to, when she falls into the basement, these, these are like honest portrayals. Like Lorraine is in the basement and she is, I actually believe that she is terrified, like terrified that these things are happening to her. And it's awesome. And you can tell Ed Warren in, in the whole thing is like trying to, he believes that his wife can get sucked into this world and never come back out. He believes it. And it's, it's, it makes the audience feel like it's, it's really happening. Yeah. So, so the performances, right? So in the beginning, you know, not the best, but these main actors sell it, even the kids, right? Because the kids had to be the ones to sell that dark space in the room or the foot being pulled or that smell of rotten eggs or rotten meat. And, you know, you expect adults to be able to carry it. But these kids did a fantastic job. And even then, I think for as, as muted as a performance as the parents, the Perones ha had to play, they were parents. They, th that was a dad. That was a mom just trying to do what they could in a weird situation. Yeah. And Ron Livingston, who plays the dad, there's a scene where the exorcism is happening and he can see that his wife is in pain, like that this is happening to his wife. And, you know, uh, he tries to stop it. And in that moment, too, I feel like he's super uh, 
honest. Like I feel as though I I can tell he wants to stop it, but he can't stop it because he knows he can't. I mean, there's it's it's crazy. It, it's very good performances by the leading characters and the kids. You're right. I mean, let's kids almost sometimes give a more honest performance in a film like this because maybe they are scared i mean think about the the makeup and the the stuff the places that they're shooting these things and the things that they they're seeing when they're kids hanging feet and this you know all this stuff that's happening to them they're probably actually scared and they they do a great job yeah, and you wonder, too, what kind of direction they receive, right? Because I would imagine there's some level of protection that kids receive nowadays. You know, maybe not back in... The, well, I mean, maybe not even as back as far as The Ring. I, I assume that was really intense if you're the little girl in that movie. But, but how much of it did these little girls actually see versus how good they were at screaming or crying when they were told to? I don't know. That would be an interesting thing to know. I would I would go along with the assumption that they're sheltered from some of it, but I mean they're in some of those scenes, pretty pretty intense scenes where their mom in the film is vomiting a demon back up out of her stomach or whatever and the, the kids are there and you know they're witnessing it. You can't hide that kind of scene if they're in the same room. So maybe they just I don't know, maybe they are 100% in. Yeah. And so talking about this movie as a horror film, I think we both agree that this is a great horror film. That just hands down one of the best ones out there. What makes it so good? What's what's what is so terrifying about this movie? Because like we spoke we spoke about earlier, they don't have to fight for people to believe them, which is a big part of a lot of movies. I mean, even Jaws has the, you know, no one's going to believe this thing. But yeah. right off the bat, we've got rules. We've got people who know how to fight it. But that doesn't make it any less scary. Yeah. I mean, I think it goes to what makes a good horror film in general. You know, I, I wrote down fear of the unknown, right? So things that you can't see are usually things that scare people a lot. You know, people are afraid to go into the ocean because they can't see what's beneath them. They don't know what's happening. It's the unknown, right? Invisible like ghosts or forces, demons in this house are what makes this scary. But the unknown part of it that's also scary is that the main characters don't perform exorcisms, right? Ed Warren in the film is not allowed to perform exorcisms. He just assists with them. So the unknown aspect there is he doesn't know what the hell is going to happen. The house starts shaking. All the stuff is falling off the, the walls and, you know, it, Oh man, when she levitates, I think that that is one of the scariest parts of that movie because it's dead silent and she just levitates in that chair. That's that's the unknown aspects in this, right? And personally, what I think is really unknown in these movies is the religion pieces of it, right? Because they're using, you know, some ancient uh, techniques and, you know, there's the whole religion aspect in a lot of these films, like the exorcist that just, it scares people for that same unknown reason. And then of course, obviously being super far away from any help. I mean, that, that helps, uh, <laughs> that helps horror movies get, uh, get the job done. Why don't they just call the cops? Exactly. But but they do have a cop, which is the best part. They hire a cop in this and he can't even do anything. I mean, he even has an experience with that maid in the, the laundry room. And what's cool, too, um, if I can remember where I was going this. Oh, yeah. It's not a get out scenario by the end. Bathsheba is keeping the wife in there. She would kill the woman. And I love it when they're trying to pull her out the door because this is what we've wanted. Just leave the house. But they can't because the demon's latched on. So no matter where they move, it wouldn't cure it. And and they're trying to push her out the door at the end and she gets the rope marks on her neck and then all of these bruises and scars. So they have to fight it in the belly of the beast, if you will. 
Yeah, it's great, right? I think that's my fa- one of my favorite scenes is when she is trying to get out of the front door and they can't get her out. And then, I mean, a lot of times in films like this, you can tell that they're they're strung up on wires when they get pulled back, you know, in the in the movie. Um, but in that specific scene, she's going through the door and then all of a sudden the demon pulls her back in away from everyone that's holding her down and she screams to her husband roger it's like oh man this is so good it doesn't look like it's uh and you know uh, everybody looks at films like that when you watch it like oh well she's on a wire getting pulled back oh how great movie magic people but honestly in that spot right there i'm like that looks really good like she gets pulled back down into the basement. Like you said, the belly of the beast. I love that part. Yeah. And maybe what adds to the horror too, is that because it's so bare bones, you, you can't see the strings unless you're really, really looking for it. You don't see those strings. So it's so easy to get lost in the fear that this thing builds up. And the fact that I love that the movie slowly builds to everything. It's it's this progression and it doesn't break the rules that were given, but it's uh, the clock stop, the dog dies, the birds commit suicide, and the fact that she starts getting bruises in the house. So we know she's being fed on that first night. And I love the fact, too, that when they first meet with uh, the Warrens, the wife simply mentions that it's an iron, some sort of iron deficiency. So the mm-hmm. connection isn't made until later when um, the the paranormal wife has that vision in the basement and finally, finally understands what's going on. Yeah, the bruises are a really cool touch and it it ramps the movie up at a very good speed. You know, it's not too slow. It's not too fast. It just it happens at a good pace where you can see uh, she's being taken over. And then obviously there's that one scene where she's sitting in the bed and she, you know, the demon appears right in front of her face and she starts retching right oh man it's good there are jump scares in this movie don't get me wrong they use you know the horror movie tricks uh a few times in this movie but it's it's few and far between that you can you know really appreciate it oh certainly and my favorite one of course is with the girls and then you see Bathsheba for the first time it's that freaking uh wardrobe and she's on the top of it and jumps down. <laughs> I pooped my pants the first time I saw that. <laughs> I mean, it's scary, right? But then there are scary moments where the little girl is sleepwalking and she's in front of the wardrobe just like banging her head on the wardrobe, right? That's that's all just creepy stuff that's happening throughout the movie. The picture frames falling off and, and things like that. That kind of stuff can happen. In like in real life, right? You're sitting around. All of a sudden, the nail gives out in the wall, and a picture frame falls. Like it, it relates a lot of real life, and it does it really well. I mean, it, just the pure fact that it's based on a true story, right? And it gets people from the beginning saying this is based on a true story. This is real people. When you watch to the end, you see the credits of that of pictures of them at the end of the film saying this is what the Warrens really looked like. Like this is real, real, real. I mean, when you leave that, you know, you come back to your house. I'm looking around right now. Shit. And I'm looking to see if there are paintings on the wall like Maybe I should make sure that this stuff doesn't fall off the wall. (laughs) Right? Well, you got to sleep with the lights on for a little bit. I know that happens (laughs) to me all the time. And the, I mean, not the worst part, probably the best part is this building of tension, especially when you see the things like um, the mom playing the hide and go clap with the little girl and she gets to the room with the wardrobe and the hands come out of the wardrobe and she goes to check it. Now, luck. Now, the genius of this is that it's not she's just some dumb teen who's drunk at a party who's going to go check it out. And it's totally the killer and the thing. She honest to God believes it's her little girl because who else would it be? And so we see her walk up to this thing and start feeling around blindly. Nothing happens. Oh, it, oh it's so good. Yeah. The hands coming out of the wardrobe is such a good moment you know yeah 
And the fact that she just, like you said, knows in that, you know, drunk teen scenario, she's scared. She probably has like a butcher knife, random ass butcher knife, whoever butchers their own meat anymore just happens to have one in their kitchen is walking up to, you know, like the closet or whatever and is scared, you know, sobbing. This is like a, a real life moment that could happen if you were playing that game, you know, with your family in your house blindfolded. Oh, man, it's good. Yeah, right. So maybe so maybe part of it, too, is that there's a legitimacy in their actions. They don't do anything because they have to do it in order to progress the plot. Like, uh, for instance, when the mom's there in the house, it's just her because her husband's out on a trip. He had to go to Florida for a week. And she that's when the pictures fall off the wall. And she thinks there's somebody in the house. So as a parent, she has to go check this enormous space to see if she can find whoever did these things. Because, you know, in her mind, it's not a ghost. It's it's somebody who's invaded her territory and she needs to protect her kids. And so she checks the hole upstairs. She checks downstairs and there's only the basement left. And then the poor husband gets home to these girls screaming. (laughs) <laughs> He's, I, I feel so bad fun. for this guy <laughs> <laughs> this brings up a good part a point though and i mean wherever you are out there right now look around yourself and think about there is space in between your walls there is space underneath the floorboard of where you're at right now unless you're driving and if you're driving just keep your eyes on the road but uh seriously though it's a scary thought Are you the original owner of your house? Did you build it yourself? If not, could there be something in the wall that you don't know about in your attic that you don't know about? I mean, maybe it's a big pile of money or maybe it's a demon. (laughs) (laughs) We're hoping for the money, but usually it's the demon. Based on all of the movies I've seen, it's never a pile of money. And that makes me so sad. (laughs) Well, no, there's one horror film where... Uh, what was it? Shoot. What's the name of the movie? I forget. But the little kid finds like a big pile of money in the basement wall. Like they, they have a hole in the wall and the mom is a fake psychic and the kid, they're like, you know, really low on money. The dad died or something like that. And they get the money out of the wall, but they find out that it's actually a ghost that's putting the money there. I I'll try to figure out what it is while we talk, but Yeah, sometimes you do find the money and a demon. But was it a good demon? No. Oh, okay. So it was it was giving them cursed money. (laughs) If you spend Uh, this money, you'll be cursed. I forget what the movie is. I'm gonna figure it out while we while we talk here. But but yeah. yeah, So I mean, just think about that. Like I'm looking around my house right now, and I'm like, yep, there's probably a demon in that wall. Probably a demon over there. And then to talk about, you know. I have a, a dog and my dog sometimes barks at stuff that's that I can't see. You know, he's barking yeah. at something that he hears outside. But honestly, he's looking at a certain direction and just barking at what's happening. And after watching this movie, I'm like, well, mm, another demon, another <laughs> just going that's around. it. We're just going to put blankets all over the TV screen. <laughs> I'm shutting the door, you know, because apparently that keeps because but another thing in this film that that blows my mind, which he sets up from the beginning with this wonderful open shot is just how big this house is. Right. So we're looking at it from on high. The crane comes down and then we follow the family through the house as they're unpacking this first day that they've gotten there. And unlike a lot of horror movies, which really kind of play with claustrophobia, you can't see every part in this house. It's too big. There are too many rooms. Even the camera, we can't see everything. There, you, there's no possible way. And, and what's scarier to you, I guess, is my ultimate question. Are you more scared in claustrophobic, where you can't get away? Or in open spaces where maybe you could get away, but it could be right around the corner. could be right behind you. I think where you can't get out is scarier 
you know, like where you're stuck in this house or in the basement and you can't get out. The You're running up the stairs to get out and the door closes and locks and you're stuck in this basement and you're helpless. But then also I'm thinking about like people that are in the woods, right? And they're running around the woods and something is chasing them. You got tons of space to run, but you're never quite fast enough. Yeah, and and I too wonder how does how do you uh, marry that with the type of horror you're gonna tell, right? What what monsters work best with those types of environments? Because I know with the slashers, you want to give your teens plenty of room to run around. That's why we're I guess why we're in campgrounds. Where whatever, because maybe the supernatural part of it is, oh, Freddy's behind that tree. How did he get there before us? It's so crazy. No one knows. Yeah, there's a movie, The Strangers, with Liv Tyler, who uh, they're in they're in a house that's in the middle of the woods, but they can't leave their house because there's people outside. That's based on a true story too. It is terrifying, right? I mean, uh. Just just terrifying. But that's like a combination of both, right? The woods aspect of it. And then also, you know, being stuck in your house. I found out the name of the film. Okay. It's the Ouija film. Ouija Origin of Evil I based on the board game. Okay, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, the little kid finds money in the basement and then goes out to Target and buys a Ouija board. I made the second part of that no, statement what? up, but the first part is real. <laughs> so he used the money to buy a Ouija board? No, no. I mean, oh, okay. I was like, man, his family's strapped for cash, but this kid really <laughs> wants to talk to ghosts. <laughs> no, I made that last part up. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so how does how does the I really gotta find out the story now. So how does the Ouija money thing? Well, the mom. It, it's been a really long time since I've seen this, okay. but in a nutshell, the mom is a fake psychic who, uh, you know, has her two daughters help her uh, have supernatural things happen in their house when people come in to get a psychic reading, right? So the little girl's in the cabinet and she's like moving the lamp post and stuff above and it's it makes people think that she's real, right? Like, if you're out there, move, make a sign, have a, have a sign. And, you know, like the candles light and it's just the little kid underneath with like a lighter lighting the candle and, and then making it happen. So anyway... The mom thinks that it would be a good idea to uh, to buy a Ouija board and the kids like manipulate the Ouija board. The mom has like a magnet underneath the underneath the table that's like moving this thing around. Well, come to find out the Ouija board is actually haunted that they get. And if you lift up the the little uh, you know, icon thing that you move around a Ouija board and the little kids look through the little glass hole. You can see like ghosts and stuff in their house, but only through that thing. It's crazy, but they do find a bunch of money in their basement. That's amazing. And maybe, okay. So this is something, right? Because in that movie, the mom totally deserves her comeuppance because she's scamming people. Right. But here in the conjuring, they're just a family and they can't move out of this house because all of their money went into buying this 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 sad, sad house. And I mean, what kind of checks would you do if you were buying a house to make sure it wasn't haunted? I would bring a I, dog with me. Yeah, bringing a dog is a good idea. You got you should bring a dog to a new house anyways, right? To kind of see if they if they like it, I guess, your kids. I don't know, though. I mean, when you're super strapped for money and a good deal pops up, you're going to be like, holy cow. But also there's that moment where you say this deal is too good to be true. Something's wrong with this house. Uh, it's interesting. I didn't know this, but there's a law in California that if someone uh, passes away on a property, whether it is uh, an apartment, a house, you know, a condo, anything for a year after they pass away, it's required by law to tell people that are going to buy that house that someone died in that in those living quarters where and how they died. So like, you know, passing away of old age or, or things like that. And uh, it's an interesting law, right? I mean, that was an interesting thing that I found out when shopping for apartments when I first moved here. Can you lawfully tell them you don't want to know? Because... I don't know. Uh, you know, if I walk into a place and I don't get chills down my spine and it feels cool and happy, 
Why would I want to know? Even if it was an old person that passed away peacefully in their sleep. That, because then I would know for the rest of my time in this place. <laughs> that and what happens after a year? So after a year, they don't got to tell you crap. You go into that house and you're like, well, this house is great. I'll take it. <laughs> it's more than a year later. And little do you know that something you know bad happened there at one point. It's crazy to think about. It's crazy. I'm putting all these thoughts in my own head. I know they're going into all too. Like, oh man, where am I living? What's living in my walls? Is my dog seeing ghosts? Oh my god, it's just Halloween. <laughs> ah, but that's the best part about this month. Okay, so so fun fact for this movie. It's rated R because it was too scary. They couldn't, they couldn't, they, they tried. They really tried to work with the MPAA to make it less than rated R. Because, you know, you're going to make more money with a lower rating. But there was no way they could cut it to not make it rated R. What are your thoughts on movies being so scary? They can't be rated anything but R. Because there's, there's no gore. There's no gratuitous sex. It's just scary. Yeah, and they, they don't. Yeah, they don't curse in the film. Like they're they're God fearing people. You know, they don't they don't curse. They don't do any of that stuff. I don't know. I don't think I would today rate this film R, but damn, it's scary. And I think maybe what the ratings board was thinking when they watched it was that it's it's too real. Maybe, you know, like it's based on a true story. It's based on people that really existed. This house actually exists. The things that they say happened in this house actually happened in the house. It's real. It's real. It's real. Now, whether somebody was actually possessed and all of this stuff happened in the basement and all that kind of stuff. And the film obviously, you know, blows it out of proportion because it is based on a true story. It's not a documentary. Right. So uh, that stuff may or may not have actually happened happened but still maybe the board was thinking this is too real for it to be pg-13 it's gonna scare people like crazy yeah but but what's the adverse effect right because the ratings there to protect uh people of different ages from seeing things before they're ready to see right i don't actually know what but it's it's more like a guide for parents i guess yeah. mm -hmm. so what then, I guess, is the problem in being that scared? I think, well, this kind of builds into my comment about imagine if you were that family, right? Yeah. At the end of the film, they exercise the demon. The demon gets exercised. They're all sitting out on the front porch. You know, the the two, uh, the couple that exercise the demon is on the front porch. They're hugging each other. She puts this, her head on his shoulder and they're like, well, time to move on to the next thing, honey. Yep. But, but first, I'm going to go get some Taco Bell. I mean, that's what it feels like, right? And then and the, the family is down in the, uh, in the yard and they're all happy and hugging each other and kissing each other and all this stuff. This does not leave you for the rest of your life you do not see your mother possessed by a demon and trying to kill you blood. by the way <laughs> chasing you down with a pair of scissors it affects you like crazy and wicked kitten in the chat has a really good point it affects you like you do not forget that is there a moment Kristen, in film that you remember uh watching when you were little that you can't forget that actually scared you because mine was actually freddy krueger and the fact that i watched it way too young because it stuck with me this whole long this whole time that film as cheesy as it is it puts you in a super vulnerable place when you're asleep so not so going asleep and not being able to control what's happening while you're asleep makes you super vulnerable. And that stuck with me forever. I didn't I honestly did not sleep for a while after seeing it. And I still think about that sometimes. Like, what if I'm not afraid that somebody's going to hurt me in my dreams like Freddy Krueger, but I'm afraid that I'm going to be stuck in a nightmare in a dream that's so scary and I can't get out of it. Right. I mean, it's, it's that vulnerability. That's crazy. 
So maybe that's what they're thinking. Long, long way around to explain what I think. Uh, but maybe it's just going to affect people so hard that they don't want kids to be affected by that. Yeah. I, yeah. And thank you for go for taking that journey. It's it's more of a, a theoretical why. Right. When when we know the blood and the guts and everything. So so guidelines and all that. But at the same time, that kind of kind of gets me because I think the ring was rated PG-13 when it first came out. Yeah, and that one's pretty scary too. And that mess that still I still haven't watched it since I was uh, since high school because of how intense that movie was. Where's the rating? And so I wonder then what the difference was. Yeah, PG-13, what the difference was between the ring and the conjuring. You know, there's no religion in the ring. Oh. Right? There's no like tie to faith yeah. or anything in that. I'm I'm pulling a grasping at straws here, but I Well, think yeah, and that... we're going on a journey here. This isn't yeah, yeah. concrete, factual. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm thinking, I'm trying to find reasons, you know, why. Uh the Exorcist is rated R, correct? Uh I believe so, but let me check it. Yeah, so it's an interesting thought to think about. Maybe that's what, maybe, yeah, I don't know. Rated R, yeah. But I, maybe you're onto something, right? When religion is brought into it, it kind of toes a certain line. But I maybe. don't know what that line is. I don't know either, but it, it's an interesting thought. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, thank you <laughs> for going on that journey. <laughs> oh. Ah, so good. Okay, so let's move on into the, the challenge question here. And I like what you chose here. Real life ghost stories. You've got one, Jeff. I do. I didn't experience it myself, but it was a story that I heard from someone that I uh, truly honestly believe this happened to them. So uh, one of my good buddies in high school, his parents owned... A, a lodge in the middle of nowhere, Arizona. It was like a beautiful place. We used to visit there every um, every New Year's Eve and we would play board games until midnight and then go walk around outside. And it was literally in the middle of nowhere. If your car broke down on your way out there, it would take like two hours for somebody to get to you back and forth from society. Um, and it was a gorgeous place and it had like six buildings. The main building was the lodge that had like, you know, 14 rooms. And then off of that main building was a general store that was probably about 200 yards away, a general store in a parking garage. Cause it would snow there. So you'd park your cars in these garages and then have to shovel them out. And then a whole bunch of little cabins around the area. Right. So, uh, there's one night, his dad is the owner of this lodge and uh, owner and operator, and there's a check-in, and it's early in the season, so it's somebody that's checking in, and they're checking into the lodge all by themselves. No one else is there, so the dad has to drive from the city all the way out to this lodge, and he gets out there, and he's like setting up the water heater and setting all this stuff up, and he's alone, and uh, they're supposed to check in that night. And so he's waiting in the lodge for them to check in and he gets a phone call from them that says that uh, they're stuck in the nearest town and they got there later than they expected that they were going to get there. Um, so they're probably not going to make it up until the next day. They just wanted to let him know that they're going to be a day late. So he's annoyed. He's pissed and, you know, he's whatever. So he starts cleaning up or whatever. He's like, you know what I should do uh, is I should just check around and make sure that everything's working. So he's walking around the, the thing and he looks out and he sees that he left a light on at the general store right so he's like oh crap i better go and uh turn that light off because i don't want to waste energy so he leaves the lodge which is a two-story building right he leaves this two-story building he walks across to the general store he turns the light off after he turns the light off he turns back to the lodge and he looks in a second floor window and there's a woman standing in this second floor window, oh, right? No. <laughs> now, this guy, he was a Marine. Yeah. He was like this, you know, he he was like a big brawly, you know, kind of dude. And he was super kind and super nice, but intense, right? He could handle a lot. 
obviously if you're going out in the woods by yourself, you can handle a lot. So he sees this person in the window, just staring at him from the general store. And he thinks, Oh, well, they got here. I didn't see, I didn't see them get here. I guess I'll go back in and check and check them in. So he goes back into the lodge. And after he goes back into the lodge, no one is there. Not only that, but the window that the woman was standing in was at the opposite end of a stairwell. So like the stairs are going up this direction. There's no way anybody could be standing in that window because there's no ledge. There's nothing, right? He gets in his car and he drives <laughs> off and he leaves the thing. And he's like, see you tomorrow. <laughs> Holy cow, man. Like people, ghosts and windows. That's hor- Oh, God. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I was no. told that story and I was like, well, we're not going there for New Year's Eve anymore. Yep. No, we're out of that one. <laughs> oh, my God. And I mean, that's a great scene in the movie that we were talking about, right? Because you see the figure in the cloth and, and it's showing its power. It can cause a storm to come in, cover up the sun. And it's like, hey, a lady who deals with ghosts, watch this. And then she... Boom, right up in the top window. Save the woman now, basically. Uh. Yep, that happened to him. I mean, uh. he claims it happened to him, and I believe this guy. I'm telling you, he's not doing it for show. Oh, my God. <laughs> like all that wigging yourself out. Maybe, right? Maybe. <laughs> oh. Oh, I, I have no story to top that but I, I like to do ghost stories in cities and the creepiest one was over at uh, Cambridge in uh, in England and it, it took us the last place we walked by was this old graveyard I mean you know European levels of old we no one even knows how far back this and it's overgrown and you know Maybe it was the ghost tour we were on or something, or maybe it was the fact that the building was blocking the sun, so it was all shaded, but, you know, it was chilly, and the story of this demonic presence that had haunted the area since about the 1300s, that's about all I got. Places like that can be super creepy. I was in New Orleans. If you ever want to go to a place to be scared like year round they have some really awesome ghost tours in new orleans that will take you around to all the above ground cemeteries and they have a lot of these statues that are you know inconspicuously lit in proper ways where they cast these shadows on tombs and stuff uh because new orleans is below sea level they have to have all of their graves above ground so the cemeteries there are you know a tourist attraction people want to go and see that not to mention the voodoo shops and stuff that they have down there it's a super cool place if you're going for like a a ghost tour vacation totally and if i'll add to that one savannah georgia that's got some really cool but but none of the above ground grave stuff it's more those those old old houses with the big trees right at sunset kind of a thing Yeah, it's crazy. There's a lot of cool places to visit like that. And then in Phoenix, I know there's a haunted hotel that, you know, everybody claims is haunted and you can stay there and it's become a tourist attraction and all this kind of stuff. And I'm sure they're I'm sure they're poking fun at people while they have this hotel. But, hey, they're making money. Exactly. And that's the important part at the end of the day. (laughs) (laughs) They're surviving. All right. So the fun questions, Jeff. We went into the Warren's room of haunted collectibles and items. Which one did you see that you wanted to know the most about that wasn't even covered? Well, I I bet we're going to pick the same one. Maybe. Mine is the samurai suit, right? Just having that samurai suit there. I'm like, whoa, what is haunted about that? You know, that that would be a cool thing that I would want to know about. Okay, and then the second question builds on this, so so stick with it. If you were that, if you were possessing that item, you're in the samurai suit, what would your story be, and how would you haunt people? You know, there's always those stories about... I find them intriguing about, you know, dictators that had people build a big shrine temple or in China, it would have been, uh, you know, the Great Wall and like all 
stuff and people died while they were making it and when they died they were just buried with you know put into the cement that was building these buildings because it was easier to bury them like that like i think things like that like poltergeist right you know building a house on top of a on top of a uh, cemetery and (laughs) telling Right. So I'm thinking about this samurai suit and I'm thinking like maybe there was this, you know, huge, you know, samurai battle and like these people died, but maybe they were betrayed. And when they were betrayed, their spirits can't fully rest because they've been betrayed. And then all of a sudden somebody comes and, you know, disrupts that in some sort of way. And it was the samurai suit that they found underground or something like that. I think that's a cool story. What about you? Ooh. Oh, th- mine was a lot sillier because toward the end they walk by this this stuffed albino looking squirrel. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, you've got relics from all over the globe and they have a stuffed squirrel. What is this thing's story? So it would be it would be a bit harmless, but what if it was a squirrel and he worked really hard to collect his little nuts for winter and he dug it all around, but then the stupid house cat dug up all of his food and ruined his stores and he died in the winter shaking his little squirrel fist. He's pissed. (laughs) Exactly. And then he just, uh, the ghost squirrel, he comes back and he just chucks nuts at people's windows. (laughs) Just scare the crap out of them? (laughs) It's more of a nuisance than a skip, but I mean, like, what could a stuffed squirrel do? I love it. I love it. I'd watch that movie for sure. Yeah, it'd be more of a comedy. I'm I'm okay with this. <laughs> what would the name of the film be? Haunted Nuts? Yeah, right. Oh Nuts, Haunted Nuts. Something you know, like that. A lot that. of these a lot of these horror movies are like The Conjuring, The Exorcist, The Strangers, The Shining, like all these things. So maybe it would just be called The Squirrel. You're right. You know, they're very straightforward with the naming. <laughs> Rarely do you get this this long thing, but I, I just want to say, I honestly believe horror and comedy are a very thin line apart because we talked about the things in the background that aren't ever addressed. And there's a Leslie Nielsen movie. I think it's one of the Naked Gun films where he's stand. They talk about this old thing of food on his refrigerator that he he doesn't even know what it is or where it's from. And at one point, you get a close-up of his face, and in the background, the food is slowly moving across the refrigerator. (laughs) And it's one of my favorite gags. But in a horror film, it's not funny. Yeah, very well said. And I think that when we get to next episode's film, that film toes the line between comedy and horror really, really but I won't reveal that quite yet. Okay, okay, because I haven't seen it, so I'm I'm pretty excited to watch this one. All oh, right. nice. Okay, cool. So uh, if you like The Conjuring, I'm going to recommend the first Saw, not any of the later ones. You can get into those if you want, but James Wan, that I think was the movie that really kind of put him on the map. Uh, the Conjuring 2, I don't think it's as good as the first Conjuring, but, you know, it's it's a ghost story with your, your favorite ghost demonologists and then of course the exorcist which even the beginning title scroll calls back to yeah it's really good the the original exorcist if you haven't seen it watch it this month i mean it's a it's a very good it's not super scary there's not a there's not a lot of jump scares and stuff it's it's got terrifying things that happen in it uh but you know the practical effects show that it's you know an older movie but it's a great story make sure you watch the exorcist for sure my recommendations two of them are because they're based on real life stories one more than the other so we talked about the stranger already or the strangers rather um that that's a scary movie that you should check out that's based on an original story and then the texas texas chainsaw massacre is actually based on a true story very loosely but it is uh it is based on a true story and it's a fun i mean it's nothing deep uh, no. It's a fun, scary movie. Yeah, to watch. but it's still good. I think that one of a lot of horror movies really still kind of leaves you feeling very uneasy at the end. Yeah, it's a it's 
I mean, Leatherface, the whole idea of all of that stuff is is pretty scary. So and then uh, I recommended Annabelle, which is a movie that I haven't seen, which is uh, a new film that's based off of the doll that's in The Conjuring. They built a whole film around it. So uh, I'll probably be checking on that one out this month for some for some reason, I don't know why I get stuck on horror films in the month of October. So I'll probably end up watching Han- Annabelle as well. Oh, totally, totally. I know uh, this year I do want to watch The Ring. I, it's time to finally revisit. But also I want to check out Insidious, which is another uh, James Wan. It's starring Patrick Wilson. So I'm, I'm just surprised I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah, Insidious is good. And it, it has the same sequel problem, though, that The Conjuring has. But the first one is is good. It's scary. Awesome. And test of time, Jeff, does The Conjuring hold up? Will it hold up? You know, I wrote this down here. Horror movies are because, you know, it's just it's a tough genre to stand the test of time. Right. The one that we see that does is The Exorcist. Right. And I do think that The Conjuring lives in the same realm as The Exorcist as far as scary movies go. Uh, I do think that this one will hold up well. It's got what we talk about every week, the practical effects. But really what I think makes a good horror film is, uh, like you said, Kristen, the lore, talking about the foundation of the story and the fact that it's based on a true story can really pull people in and people are going to be intrigued with this film for many, many, many years because of because of those things. Yeah, totally. All right. What's next then? I know we alluded to it, but what is next? Next, we're watching Get Out, which you can watch on iTunes or Prime Instant Video. If you're a Prime subscriber, you can watch Get Out. This movie is really, really good. It won Oscars. It's it's a it's a horror slash comedy film slash crazy. I mean, there, it's it's a good film. So if you want to watch another scary movie, watch Get Out before our next episode. And we'll talk about it. Woo! All right. Well, if you, uh, you're really excited about Get Out and want to share your thoughts, best place to do that is on Twitter, at TPACast. Monday, I usually put up the tweet asking a question, your favorite scary part. But with this one, what question do you think I should ask, Jeff? What would you like to know? Ooh, I don't know. Maybe what would you do if you were the main character in this movie differently? Oh, I so- like that one. So maybe, I mean, if you're talking about The Conjuring, be like, hey, move. <laughs> don't, don't buy a haunted house in the middle of nowhere. You know, let's, don't invite a, a demon to inhabit the soul of a doll. Yeah, yeah. Step one, don't be an idiot. Um, but with Get Out, you f- the main characters find themselves in a predicament that's kind of... Uh, binding in a whole bunch of weird ways and i want to know what would you do if you were in that story so that's an interesting question to ask Ooh, perfect that will definitely definitely go out on monday then all right jeff where can people find you when you're not here if you're looking for me you can find me on twitter at mr jeff reynolds all one word where we're talking about anything and all things and some things and sometimes nothing Always a celebration, though. Yeah, because old deer, you're, you're moving through old deer. So I like seeing your progression through that. <laughs> yes, lots of games, lots of fun stuff. Check it out. And if you're looking for me, I am at underscore Kristen Ashton underscore on Twitter, Twitch, Instagram. And as for the show, you can find us right here, twitch.tv slash Dream Destroyer every other Sunday. And we will be back October 21st with Get Out. So you've got two weeks, two weeks to watch this movie. And thank you all for hanging out and chat. And if you want to support us, head on over to patreon.com slash TPA cast. And with that, Jeff, any final words? Something awful happened here, Ed. <laughs>